Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education by Kate Colbert and Joe Salustio with contributions by Elvin Freitas is now available for pre-order on Amazon. Get your Kindle edition or your softbound book. It's going to be amazing. Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to add up on the Edup Experience podcast, where we make education your business. And we've done that now over 500 times. As you know, we're writing a book called Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education, where we take our first 100 presidents and we write a book around all the great things that they've said. And then we continue to bring on amazing folks onto this podcast to give you the incredible insights that you need to operate with flexibility in an inflexible world. No, higher ed is changing, isn't it? Um, and that's what I think we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the recognition uh, of of time for change, how you create change, um, what you do, what are the barriers and the obstacles. And I'm going to bring in somebody that you know well. She does have an Edip Experience co-host mug, I think. I think I sent her one. Didn't I send you one? I think I did. Here she is, ladies and gentlemen, back to the podcast. She's Dr. Emily Barnes, and she's Provost and Vice President of Academic Affairs for Siena Heights University. What's up, Emily? Hey. Well, I really like the sound effects, Joe. Well, thank you. And I'm happy to be back. It's been uh, it's been evolving, um, mm-hmm. you know. So I have all this new stuff like this. Everybody needs to feel the love, right? So I've you know every day I go and I find these very obscure things that, um, and then yesterday was well, since I knew you were coming on, I really went deep into the vault. To make sure I had enough for you. What would you get? Anything good? Um, you know, I got this one. Feeling good now? Oh, now I yeah. felt like that was an Emily kind of thing, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I think so too. You know, we, so do, I, I want to give away the whole kit and caboodle here, you know? Sure, sure. I want to wait until we get uh, our guest here, because you're my co-host today, right? That's you're right. co-hosting with me. And I want to bring my guest on. Um, I think this might be a first. I don't know if this is a first. Uh, but ladies and gentlemen, we have with us today... The president of Siena Heights University, she is Dr. Peg Albert. Peg, what's going on? Are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Good morning. Good 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 morning. What's going on? Oh, a lot. A lot. Higher (laughs) education today. Well, that we needed that. We needed that pause to get ready to talk about the a lot. That's what we needed, which is great (laughs) because I, you know, it, it is, um, it is a funny uh, time for higher ed, isn't it, Peg? I mean, when you um, think about what the future looks like, it forces you to look so internally into the way higher ed works. And so you, I can only venture to guess, and this is a total assumption, right? Assume, you know, what, the, what, what that stands for, right? That you recognize that it might be time for change in your institution because you brought in uh, who was somebody that I would like to call a fierce change maker in Dr. Emily Burns. So talk about Siena Heights University a little bit. What do you guys do? How do you do it? And, you know, what's the state of the university? Well, first of all, the most important thing to us is our mission. And uh, um, it's amazing that so many of our students can recite our mission. When mm. uh, we were here up for accreditation a few years ago, um, the accreditor said, we can't believe that your students know the mission, you know, Amazing. faculty and staff. So um, that's where we build all of our decision making around our flexibility, our, our willingness to change, because we know we have to be relevant uh, to our students. And we know that we have to prepare them to go out into a world that's going to be ever changing, mm-hmm. ever changing. And So students need to be flexible, adaptable, um, be able to uh, trans, uh, you know, to be able to use their skills in many, many different uh, settings and to transfer those skills very easily. So higher education is uh, into uh, a lot of change these days because if you don't change right now, you're gonna die. Mm. Change or die. Yep. So you t- so one of the things you hit on that I think is a critical topic is relevance. Mm-hmm. You know, higher education being uh, relevant, are degrees relevant, are non uh, non credit certificates relevant? Is online education relevant? Is hybrid uh, education relevant? When you work through the idea of relevance, what what do you see? How do you how do you 
drill down into relevance um, and, and prepare your institution for the future? Yeah, uh, relevance um, relevance cha is is change itself in a lot of ways because mm -hmm. relevance uh, is what is needed at the time. Um, when a student is particularly here at a certain point in time. When I first came here uh, 16 years ago to Siena, um, students needed a certain thing. But now that thing is different. And if we don't change, uh, we're not living our mission well by helping our students to become competent, purposeful, and ethical. So I, I think that um, you have to look at sort of the signs of the times. Make sure our students have basic foundations in things and in life lessons as well, but then be able to pivot so easily uh, to transfer their skills to all kinds of different areas. Mm -hmm. um, and not only skills, but a, a sense of um, uh, being um, analytic, you know, being able to communicate, being able to write. So many students today, you know, are you so used to texting that they don't know how to write a complete sentence, you know? Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, that happens. And um, so um, being able to communicate and work as team members is so important. So I think relevance, uh, it takes on, of course, just by the very word, different meanings during different times and hopefully universities are in positions to still provide foundational work, but also to be able to uh, really zero in on what's important for the students to learn today. Mm -hmm. So you think that, do you think that people help create relevance? And I, you know, cause you brought in Emily, um, I, I would assume not for, for, um, for no reason, right? You brought her in for a particular reason. I, I find my, my personal feeling is that that people help create relevance because they look at things differently. They, you know, uh, something that, you know, the seven worst words in business are we've always done it that way. Mm -hmm. um, and anytime you enter an institution or a new, new job or somebody goes, to, we, this is just what we do. We've always done it that way. And you go, no. Joe. Yeah, Emily, you don't say that. What um, do you mean? People um, say that. Yeah, yeah. Oof. Uh, but but uh, yeah, when you hear that, you just go, oh, shocking. So you so you bring in people that can create that change. How's uh, how's the transition been so far for you as you've uh, moved this university forward and bringing in new talent? Are you talking to me? Or yeah, you Emily? and that. Yeah, because I can't ask Emily about Emily. She's going to tell me she's doing a great <laughs> job, which I already know. But. Yo, it's good to have new a new set of eyes and a, a new uh, perspective on things now and then. You know, and so uh, when we brought Emily in and then a new dean at the same time, first of all, they complemented each other very well. Um, and secondly, they both have the vision that we need right now in higher education as far as academics go. So um, um, Emily's not a cha uh, afraid of change um, and she encourages change. And um, I think that uh, we made made a good choice. And mm. uh um, so, uh, you know, uh, sure, Emily has to learn the institution and the culture a little bit more yet, but, but that will come in time. That, that's just something that I had to do when I got here. Everybody has to do when they get it to mm -hmm. a new place. But I have a lot of faith in our future because I think she's able to um, help the faculty see that change isn't a bad thing. It's a good thing. Um, and it better serves our students uh, than um, having your feet stuck in cement sometimes where uh, you can't move and do the kinds of things that you need to do. Emily, over to you, because I know that um, I'm sure when you stepped in there and you said, all right, we got to take a look at how we change things. You got this first, right? Ah! You know, and then you have to move by that. <laughs> you got to move by that moment. <laughs> So absolutely. And I would say that, you know, coming into um, Siena Heights has been a, uh, a, a great adventure um, so far. It's, it's fun to learn a new place and to get to know new people. Um, but I think what drew me here really was that receptiveness and openness to, um, to making the transformation to what higher ed needs to be today. Um, 
the culture. Uh, it's a it's a good culture. The mission really is. She's right about that. Everyone does greatly support the mission, and that was part of what brought me in as well. Um, also, I think that you know, looking at um, you know, Sister Peg, uh, Doctor Peg, um, you know, and then the u- unique elements of this institution. What a what a wonderful way to continue to sculpt, you know, my experiences as well, um, and and how I can, of course, be in service the institution. I love it. Um, lots of change, but I think ultimately, you know, when I interviewed here, you know, it was time to be bold again. Um, oh because, yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that um, we all know that I love small independent institutions. Um, I think that they're a great resource because not all students are going to go to bigger schools um, and they need to have a place to go. And I wanna make sure this one is around for much, much longer um, so that those students have that opportunity. So I'm happy to be here. So what does it look like, Emily, as you step into a new role, talk about you know um, your transition in, you know, what what how do you survey the landscape of Siena Heights University and say, you know what, the, here's some things that we can do that make a big difference right away. Here are the bigger things that we need to change over time and we need to get people along with us, right? Because there is this bringing people along part of change management. But there are always quick wins when you just go, oh, I don't know why we, we could just change this and do this this way or do that that way and it can make a difference for the students. Can you talk about your your insertion as it were, a little bit, and how you and Peg have worked together to identify what needs to change? Yeah, well, I think I'll, I'll carry on with what she said first, which was, you know, relevance is about taking in the times of higher education. And for me, it's, we, we know that higher ed is a consumer-driven model at this point in time. Um, so I think it's not resisting that is number one. So you can see all the opportunities that's available um, versus, well, this is what's in place, so we can't do X, right? Or we can't do Z. And um, so keeping that openness is critical. Um, I will say that, you know, looking at Siena Heights, there's the basics, you know, look at enrollment, look at the community, look at the market, look at the um, programs that are being offered and how those align with the overall market, the saturation of the market, what other institutions are offering and what we really do best. Um, And I think that, you know, there's always um, opportunity to kind of, look at the structure of programs. So that's that's where I like to spend the most time. It's not really necessarily the disciplines that you offer, it's how you offer them that can make the biggest difference. And, um, you know, making things more accessible, of course, and online um, as needed. And then, um, you know, just expanding those offerings in a way that best serves the students. So kind of like flipping the model a little bit of focusing more on that student um, than, than anyone else. And I think that to answer the last question, um, it's been, what's the word? Um, I called it an adventure earlier, but I'm gonna call it an adventure again. It's um, one, I love the opportunity to learn from Peg. You know, I think that um, for me, you know, coming in at my stage of career, it's it's been one of those uh, moments for, for influence in a very positive way. Um, and then I think the openness, she has so much openness as far as, you know, she knows that change is needed, um, but then when we talk about, you know, some of the opportunities that we have, I think that I appreciate most the, the openness. So our, our communication lines have been um, direct, but also just here's what the landscape is. Here's where things, you know, here's our opportunities and then just unpacking those. And so it's been really good. And Dr. Peg, you, you um, as you take a look at CN Heights, you've been there for a while and you've seen the evolution of the institution. Um, there's been tough times, obviously COVID is unlike anything anybody could have ever expected, but now we're, we're outside of that. We move forward. There's challenges to the value of higher education now, unlike anything we've ever seen and anti intellectualism, if you will, um, non-credit credentials, big companies getting into that market. There's a lot of noise around the student. And so for nonprofit, small private nonprofit institutions, we, you, you have to be really, really good at messaging. Um, and selling, for lack of a better word, to students who are looking for this type of education. So, so how do you position? Talk about positioning a little bit. Where do you see Siena Heights as a in its positioning to serve students? And how do you identify those types of students? And what needs to be done to serve those types of students? And t- talk about that a little bit. And there's a lot of questions there, I know. Yeah, I, I think um, small private institutions, and we're a faith-based institution, um, it makes it can make a difference in people's lives 
um, not just, um, we look at education holistically, the whole person, uh, not just the intellectual life, but the uh, emotional, spiritual, um, physical, and um, of course, intellectual life. Um, and we think all of those things are important. And if that's a value to students and their parents, they'll come here. Yes. I think, unfortunately, sometimes we just look at higher education as only a place from where you get a job. Okay. That's, that's important. I mean, that's one of the reasons why you come to college, but it's not the only reason. And I think people don't realize the sort of life skills you can learn here, uh, living with other people, especially in a society that tends to isolate itself right now, I think more than, more than ever. And then COVID didn't help us with that. Um, uh, so I, I think that the value of higher education is much broader than most people see it to be. And um, uh, when, you, when you look back on your own college days or, uh, and I know that was a million years ago for me. So, you know, uh, but uh, it, it's, um, it's changed a lot, but a lot of those same basic needs are there. Mm -hmm. People wanna be belong to a community. They wanna be able to express themselves. They wanna be able to develop themselves. And they may not even realize what they're doing at the time, uh, but particularly with our traditional undergraduate students. Uh, but I, I think that in, 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 uh, with some uh, thoughtful reflection as they graduate and, and the years go on, when our alumni came, come back, it's amazing what they say they experienced here with uh, some hindsight. And uh, so I think that, um, people have to open up their minds and hearts to what higher education really is. It's not just go to college and get a degree. Although I, I know that's extremely important and, and we meet those needs as well, but we do so in an atmosphere where the whole student can develop and um, where there's more of a personal care for people because we're small enough to do that. You know, uh, the other, yes, just the other day I, I got a message from uh, somebody that, you know, uh, one of our kids' cars broke down and they need some money to fix it. Now, would that end up in a president's office at, and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> most universities? But that was on my desk, you know, and, um, uh, and we'll do everything we can to help that student, you know, um, that personal touch, which is so important in today's world. So I, I think that, uh, universities and, and colleges um, have to open up and sell their value. You know, uh, that's a value in our world today. But there's a lot of competition out there, particularly in the Midwest and the East, for the same student. And so um, uh, with money tight these days, a lot of people look for, you know, where can I get the best cost? Mm -hmm. But you you know, for a few dollars more or a few dollars less sometimes, you can get a much better education, a holistic education at another institution. And CN is one of those institutions. Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education by Kate Colbert and Joe Salustio with contributions by Elvin Freitas is now available for pre-order on Amazon. Get your Kindle edition or your softbound book it's going to be amazing. Hmm, I love it. I love that explanation of higher ed and its value. I, I will say that uh, on top of that, Emily, you know this, there is a, a trend towards online, more online, whether it's a po post-pandemic consequence, I don't think so. I think it just got there faster, right? There was an article that came out, I think this week or last week, saying that even the traditional undergraduate student that would normally attend residential campuses exploring online more often. And so I know at Lindenwood, which of course we're in the Midwest, right around the same area as you guys are here in St. Charles, Missouri, we're in within the same, let's say stratosphere, if you will, we're seeing the same thing. The students are just trending more towards online. Now we have about 7,000 students or a mid-sized institution, but we see that fluctuation of just more students going, do you have more online? Do you have more online? 
What does that look like for Siena Heights University in terms of online offerings, the future of online, Emily, as you see it? Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. So I think that it's just a having online education is now no longer a strategic intent. It's more or less a um, standard box check. Um, that's my at this point in my career, what I've seen and where we are in the times. Uh, obviously, curriculum has to be available in an online setting. Um, there's not much to, it's going to sound horrible. There's not much to discuss there. I feel like, you know, that distinction between the value of online and on ground, um, of course, there's, there's plenty of arguments for either, but when it comes to supporting the student and what they're seeking, um, even though there's plenty of argument that says, well, on ground, they get these skills. We can teach this better this way. You know, there's, there's definitely applicability to the on ground setting. Um, however, you know, as a consumer driven market, I think that, um, online is expected. Um, it's just expected to be there. Um, and, and so much so that when it's not, it's almost surprising at this point. What do you mean? Oh, I can't take it online. You know, it's just bizarre. Um, so to me, it's, a it's a normal that's been around for a long time. It's definitely not a new one. Um, I know that for some it's still new, um, but for me, it, it's, it's been something that's been a constant. And I think it's something that has to be offered. Um, and then for those students who want to be on ground, um, I mean, they need to have that experience as well, um, because I do agree with Peg completely that, um, you know, there's there's a lot to be said about both modalities um, or all modalities, we'll just say that, um, depending on what the student needs and how they learn best. I also think that, you know, when it comes to the relevance piece and also what, you know, what, what are the students getting, you know, that holistic education, I see that here every day, um, so much so that, you know, what's, you know, how do we, as a liberal arts institution as well, you know, how do we emphasize the skill sets you know, how do we emphasize the the takeaways of a liberal arts education when that's on the cutting block so many times and it shouldn't be? Um, liberal arts education to me is the secret sauce. OK, you know, if you want a person who has a flexible mind, you know, that's flexible cognition, you're going to get it through liberal arts because it teaches you to do that. That self-reflection. You know, I will say that she used what's the word uh, self-reflection. You know, we we use the word contemplate a lot here. Um because uh, that's general practice, but that's critical thinking. Um, that's creative thinking. That's across the board. You know, these simple things. Last week, I had a conversation with somebody regarding um, the value of visual and performing arts. You know, you might say, well, there's there's not a job if you go to school for theater. And I'm like, oh, indeed, there is. Because what does a student grow? What do they develop being in visual and performing arts? Um, what type of confidence, speaking skills, communication skills, working on the fly, being able to shift and pivot and adapt, do they learn from being on a stage, right, in front of a room full of people, things that many graduates cannot stomach for any any time at all, you know, speaking in public or um, being able to present their case or their, or um, make that argument. So I think that obviously there's, there's a ton of skills, um, but the holistic piece is also caring for the individual like they're one of your own. Um, you know, how best are we serving? And that can be done online, hybrid, high flex. That can be done um, remote. That can be, you, you name it, whatever term you want, whatever ones you like, it can be done in all those settings. And I think that um, for us, providing those opportunities are going to be key. Um, and then also looking at how, how are we able to instill those skills um, where we've once relied on on, on ground or, or in-person connection how do we train? How do we um, improve? How do we modify how we do what we do so that it can be done th through distance and still get the same, you know, get a good result from the education experience? And I think that that's an evolution that has to occur on every every inch of the institution as well in, in the hearts and minds of the people who are who are teaching, um, which is a which is a good thing. Um, you know, faculty have amazing skill sets. Um, with their abilities to connect their discipline to their students. So regardless of the mechanism, um, that can be done. Uh, one of my favorite quotes, I'll say this from a professor I interacted with long ago at a different institution. It was a culinary school. And he said that a good chef can cook a chicken breast on a piece of tin foil if that's all they have. And I Beautiful. Thought, yeah. So to <laughs> me, you know, professors, it's just the mechanism. So we can't focus on the mechanisms and we can't focus on the devices. We focus on 
what is it that we're trying to do for our students and however we get there is how we get there. Yeah, it's a, Dr. Pegg, it's a interesting um, dichotomy because you just look at, um, you know, I, t I tell here at Lindenwood, we're going through a lot of the same kind of discussions about what the future is and online and on ground because we have a huge on ground presence as well. And um, I always say, like, do we want to be in the game? Right. If you want to be in the game, you have to have all the players. If you don't have the players, you can't compete. And mm -hmm. in a world that you, back to your point, that is much more competitive for a student, you have to have the players. And the players are on ground or hybrid or online or modalities and programs. And you have these players. And if you don't have all the players, you're not going to be able to capture, you're not going to win the game. You're not going to be able to compete. And as higher ed, uh, becomes a more commodified marketplace, as it were, because the student can go, you know, hey, look, uh, Santa Heights doesn't have this online. I'm just going to go over here and get this online from this other institution. See you later. It's not like, and I say this all the time, too, it's not like we capture that student and they go, I want to come here so badly. And that might be the case for some, especially for on-ground residential. But for students looking online, a lot of it becomes a, a, a marketplace like an amazon marketplace so they go what about this one what about this one so capturing that student is much harder if you don't have the players in the game so but that's hard to explain i, I find to a campus community um that is used to doing something the same way so I, i've been calling it internal inertia you get some of that like uh you know where you say something and then Everybody hears it, and then you go back to the same meeting, you get the same exact question that you had from the previous meeting, you give the exact same answer, and it's like people heard it for the same time, for the first time, and you go, wait a minute, I already answered that, like four, t four meetings in a row. Mm -hmm. How do you get over the hump of the internal inertia? Well, I think people have to see somewhat of an urgency in order to do that, you know, um, and certainly today in higher ed, there's urgency. I mean, anything you read will talk about how higher ed needs to change to meet the needs of the student, the present and the future. Um, for example, we started online education a long time ago with adult students particularly. And for the last eight years, we've been ranked number one in Michigan for online education. Wow. Um, yeah. And, uh, and ranked very high in student engagement because see, Students' needs don't change just because they're online. Uh, and so you have to be able to create a sense of community online. Yes. And, and that's what happens when people know how to engage students online. There is a sense of community. Um, and, uh, and it's wonderful to see when some of those online students come from graduation and are able to meet some of the professors they had in person uh, for the first time. Um, my nephew went here online. And when he came, he said to me, you know, I want to meet so and so and I want to meet so and so they were my favorite teachers. And um, uh, it was it was like a reunion almost, you know, and um, so you still have to create those bonds and relationships, even when you're online, because people learn better when that happens. Uh, um, if there's a if there's a healthy sense of a relationship there, and I, I think that we can do that, and Emily is going to be um, you know setting the bar for the faculty as to uh, what level of skills they have to have in order to to uh, re you know remain here at Siena to teach, um, and they're going to have to be flexible online on ground hybrid whatever the students needs are. And so uh, um, faculty are called to do much more now, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, but students are called to do much more too. We're all called to do much more. Um, we also have to look at alternative ways to educate people. Um, we have partnered with core education and because certificates and badges are so uh, important today. And, um, uh, uh, they do the marketing for us, but you know we'll be we'll be uh, teaching individual students um, online and also groups of students online through uh, um, you know when uh, when they go and and market our our programs to different companies, you know. Uh, so 
so it, it's looking at different ways to do things to get at different populations of people who need to either be trained or retrained or whatever in order to meet their uh, the goals that they, they have in their lives for themselves, be they career or just personal um, uh, improvement in some way or another. Um, and we have to do that with a sense of community because isolation is not good for anybody. Yeah, that's a really good point, right? The, the, uh, the stronger and more robust the community, the better the retention, the better the outcomes. I mean, that is an important part, whether you're online or on ground. That's exactly um, right. And yes. you need an internal community to make the external communities happen. And that's what coalition building is about, all about and change management is all about. I, I do, I do b I believe, and I, of course I have worked in higher ed for like 20 years, but I have to believe that higher ed is very difficult at times to change. For, it is. It's because of the regulations. Tradition. Yeah, because of tradition, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Of, I, and I, one of the things I've always said is that we, we have to be, higher ed has to be as fast as the technology company. Because the technology company is redefining what education looks like. And so if we're not that fast, we're going to get left behind. And so, Emily, how do you, how do you bring those concepts together of speed? Because of, speed is a critical element, I find, that's mm -hmm. lacking. Urgency. You said it, Peg. You said urgency. This urgency of, we got to do this right now. We can't go through the, what gives me the hot sweats is the word committee. Anytime I hear the word committee, I immediately think slow. <laughs> it is going to slow everything down. And then everybody's got to give input. Not that I want to be a dictator because I don't, but sometimes you just got to move fast. You got to move fast. How can other companies do it? And we can't, right? So how do you bring all those concepts together, Emily, to, to get back to the original point of relevance? Yeah. Okay. I like that. So just starting down a few things here. Uh, you know, first, I think do it fast, do it speedy, right, right down fast. Yeah. Uh, I think it comes down to the people, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I think that um, higher ed needs people with a servant's heart and a servant's mind. Um, so they're willing to do what it takes, you know, for the, for the institution, for the student, for their experience um, and being very outwardly focused when they do that. Um, sometimes <laughs> I think, yeah, well, it's true. But I think that sometimes, and everybody, I would include everybody in this statement, can be, um, you know, look internally of how this affects me versus how does this, you know, move us forward um, in a way that that's that's helpful to the institution. Um, now, to answer your question a little bit more direct, I think that it also comes down to structure. So when it when we talk about operations of a program itself, you know, I call it the quick change effect, um, you know, but you know, segmenting overall curriculum structure to be as lean as possible and as flexible as possible. Think about like, remember like those, uh, I, and I'm using my hands, so I apologize. I'll describe it with words. So remember those uh, little blocks that would make a word like cat and one of the block was a C and you could rotate it and it would become a B and it'd be like bat. And then you would turn it again and it would be like a S and it'd be sat. And then you could turn the I, the A and it comes I. And, you know, so those are like three letters. Okay. So imagine like- what. Yeah. <laughs> so imagine like 10 of those rotating blocks on a, on a, on a, a stick or something, okay, or a post or string or whatever. And curriculum has to be built to turn that fast. I so like that. by segmenting curriculum into sizable nuggets, you want to say, or blocks, I call them blocks. Um, and then you already identify which blocks can flick in and can flick out. So which ones can come off of the line? Okay. The easiest. And then which ones can turn? So you got to have ones that are removable and can be replaced. You need to have ones that can turn and have a new letter exposed. So for what? instance, uh, if we're talking about communications programming and we have a high focus on using a certain really popular uh, communication software or really popular word processing software, and we're going to put in now a certificate on here's this and here's how to use it and here's how you can apply it to work. Um, if that institution goes out of business, Okay, or changes its name or changes all of its settings and all of its buttons, then we know exactly what portion, what block it belongs in, how many classes are affected immediately. Um, and then we're able to simply turn it because we know we got a zero right in. So having those things all identified in advance is critical to being flexible and adaptable right now. So we can turn on a dime if we design it to turn on a dime. And sometimes to start, you have to be willing to 
start from scratch. And that's terrifying, but sometimes you gotta, you gotta redo it because we are still, I think about like, how long have we been modifying the same curriculum? Years upon years, it's been modified, maybe modified Yikes! sometimes, not at all, but it's been modified. So similar to, um, you know, like repairing your car, when things go out of date, you know, like before you had the cassette player and then you put the cassette player in there with a little string on it. And then that played your CD player. And then you had a little auxiliary thing that played your, the, the first edition iPod, iPod, you know, <laughs> you had it set, you had all the these 3.5 millimeter plug. Yeah. That one. Yes. Mm -hmm. So at what point do we get rid of 20 adapters? Okay. So that we can run all these different things in the same car. When do we just chuck the car and get a new one? And I think that's where we are is, you know, and then this time the new car has very replaceable mechanisms so that we are able to sustain the change forever. Mm, I like it. Mm -hmm. Well, you guys, this has been awesome. I, I you know, I, I have to tell you, I love um, conversations around change and facilitating, creating, overcoming um, uh, chain barriers. And, and so I want to just leave the last cu couple of questions to you, Dr. Pegum. Number one, uh, the first one there is, um, what did we not say about Siena Heights University today? Anything you'd like to say about the history, about upcoming events or graduates, anything at all, you get to plug your university uh, a million ways from Sunday. And then number two, you get to tell me what the future of higher education looks like. Well, I think Sienna is, um, of course, I'm prejudiced. I'm the president. and uh, um, But uh, it's a wonderful place to people to grow, to be, to learn, to excel, um, to have opportunities uh, that they wouldn't have at a larger institution. Um, leadership uh, formation, all kinds of things that are available to our students in a community that cares about one another. And I mean, really cares, you know? And uh, so, um, and it has a lot of opportunities and offerings for people to meet. I always say we're small enough uh, um, to, to uh, meet people's, uh, to, to be able to um, explore all kinds of things with young people and not so young people, because we have Shoe Global and all these other, uh, you know, online programs and things of that nature. But we're large enough to meet their dreams, and uh, and so um, that's what Sienna is all about. You be you 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 uh, become a whole person here. Um, and Fantastic. Oh. Yep. <laughs> and then. Uh, the future of higher education is one of flexibility. If you're not able to flex and and uh, um, be able to keep a foundation and a mission going within a uh, in an atmosphere of change, relevance, um, uh, all kinds of things that are going to be coming our way, not only now but in the future, you're not going to survive. And Sienna is a survivor. It's been here for over a hundred years now. Uh, and it has people who are dedicated to its mission and want to see it continue, continue. So it will, so it shall be. This is mm -hmm. my last year here. Um, as, oh, are you as, retiring? Yeah, I'm getting old. Congratulations. Yeah. This Thank is you. incredible. Yeah. Uh, let these uh, younger ones come up and, and uh, you know, I, I think that there's a time when you step aside, you know it's time for new leadership, and you know it's time to give the younger uh, generation a chance. Okay, so I feel that's that time in my life right now. I'll go on and do something else um, that will be meaningful and be of service to people. Podcasting, maybe? No. <laughs> think about it. Who knows? It. Who knows? But uh, anyway, wherever God calls me to be, that's where I'll go. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, but I thank you for this opportunity to share about CN and about higher education, which I love dearly. And um, I'm very happy that Emily's a part of our community now. And Joe, it's nice to meet you and you do a good job. So thank thank you. you. I appreciate yeah. you. Well, you know, we think, uh, me in particular, think very highly here of Dr. Emily Barnes. Um, she's come on before. We've gotten to know each other pretty well. I know she's a change maker and 
uh, uh, when you talk about what the future of higher ed looks like, it, it, it's somebody like Emily who I think can bring that rapid and swift change to to uh, to an industry that doesn't like rapid or swift sometimes. Yeah. So yeah. you got to hit that balance right. Uh, Emily, thanks for coming back. We appreciate oh, you, really? you know. Yeah, and you heard her. See, this is what I'm saying. How how good did you feel? You felt warm and fuzzy inside listening to her say how much she, you know, is is grateful for, you know, like thankful for the, yes. the opportunity. This is why um, I, I love working at Santa Heights because um, you, you feel like you're seen and valued. And I love that. So I'm just, I'm not putting in a pin. I'm just very serious. That's my authentic response. And I think, you know, um, you know, why, why we carry that, you know, all the change that we do need to make, um, having the support is, is amazing. So. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. well, well, I, I applaud I, you too. Thank you. I always say at Sienna, uh, no one is better, higher, lower than anybody else. We're all the same. We just have different roles. Mm -hmm. Isn't that the truth? Because yeah. the student is the one that has to benefit in the end. That's exactly right. Or else we right. don't have jobs. None of this. That's exactly right. right. Yep. That's well, right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, appreciate you, um, of course. And let me outro you appropriately here. Dr. Emily Barnes. Uh, she is Provost and Vice President of Academic Affairs for Siena Heights University. Emily, thanks for returning after I think a year absence from your co-hosting um, responsibilities mm -hmm. here at Up. It's been a it's been a bit, you know. Yeah, we've been busy. We like having you around. Well, don't get so busy that you can't come guest host with me every now and then. And I'm saying that in front of your boss so that she lets you. Uh, but I think this might be the first time we had a, a vice president, a provost, and president on at the same time in all of these 500 and something episodes. So uh, I love firsts. Um, and of course, somebody that is bringing us the firsts and, uh, and the feel goods is my guest, our guest, your guest today. She's Dr. Peg Albert, and she's president of Siena Heights University, Dr. Pegg, uh, an honor to know you and talk with you. Um, and it's been a pleasure having you on. Did you have a good Oedip experience today? I had a wonderful experience. It's always good to be with people who, who love higher education and, uh, because that's what's going to change the world. Mm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, with that, you've just ed upped. Commencement. The Beginning of a New Era in Higher Education by Kate Colbert and Joe Salustio with contributions by Elvin Freites is now available for pre-order on Amazon. Get your Kindle edition or your softbound book. It's going to be amazing.